السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نحمد الله ونسلع على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسهمه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله Continuing with what's been our topic for the past few months, which is Imam Hussain al-Salam in Karbala. Yeah. And as we said, we, even when we started, you know, all of Islam is contained within it. You know, the example that Imam Hussain al-Salam gave us, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu said, al Hussein minni wa ana min al Hussein." That Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Uh, and this, you know, again, as we mentioned, this doesn't mean that, oh, he's his grandson. You know, there was no doubt, no one questioned whether he was the grandson of Rasulullah or not. You know, and it's one thing to say that your son is from you, but the son, or, or but the father being from the son is something totally different. And so what Rasulullah is teaching us is that every aspect of the character and everything Imam Hussain al-Islam does is in line with what Rasulullah has done. You know, his mannerisms, his character, every aspect of his life. And standing in the face of injustice without any hesitation. Standing up for the oppressed against the oppressor. You know, of course, you know, the worst form of oppression is shirk. The worst form of oppression is disbelief. And Islam came with the purpose of uprooting all oppression. The way to be free, to be truly free, is to connect yourself with Allah and His Messenger. <laughs> this is true freedom. And the oppression of this world ends when you die. The worst oppression is, is, is what is to come. If we oppress ourselves, by not accepting Allah and His Messenger <laughs> then we should prepare ourselves for a worse form of oppression because we are oppressing ourselves by doing this and so in the hereafter there is nothing for us except the fire so now, as we mentioned last week, you know, eventually, while Imam Hussein al-Islam is in, this, in the state of prostration, he is prostrating himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Asr Salat, is when they kill him, and of course he doesn't die, because the martyrs are not dead. You know, if we look at the verses that we started off with, which are the verses in Surah Baqarah, you know, where Allah says, 
يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَبَشِّرِ وَلَا تَقُولُوا لَمَنْ يُقْتَلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ وَلَا نَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنْ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ where it says, O you who believe, seek help through salat and patience. And those who have been, and do not say of those who have been slain in the way of Allah that they are dead. Because they are alive, but you cannot comprehend it. You know, their life is so much above your life. Their living is so much more than our living that we can't even comprehend their living. And then surely, Allah SWT says, we will surely test you with something of hunger and, and fe of fear, of hunger, of, of loss, of wealth, of your lives and your offspring, and glad tidings to those who are patient. And we see that, that example of patience in Karbala. But as they are martyring him, as they are taking his head away from his body, they are saying what? They are saying, Allahu Akbar. There is again, all of them claim to say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what is on the tongue has no meaning, has no value, unless it comes from the heart. You can be praying five times a day, giving zakat, making hajj. You can make hajj every year. Fast all year long. You know, instead of giving 2.5%, you can give 20% in zakat. Make all your five daily prayers and stay up all night making qiyam uh, al-layl. Doesn't matter. Unless there is iman. To all actions, the prerequisite is iman. It is faith. And what is Iman? No. When Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Umar radiallahu anhu, how much do you love me? And Umar radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than everything else in the world except myself. And what does Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say to him? He says, your Iman is not complete. complete. And now Umar, he has to dig down, he starts looking and focusing, and now he says, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than everything in the world, including myself. No. And Rasulullah says, Al-An, now. Now your Iman is complete. Various hadiths which are in Bukhari and Muslim, that none of you is a believer unless, you lo unless he loves me more than he loves his, his forefathers, his offspring, his, and all of uh, mankind combined. None of you has Iman unless, you, unless he loves me unless, more than he loves his forefathers, his offspring, and all the wealth in the world. And so the simple definition of Iman is the love of Allah and His Messenger. <laughs> and you cannot claim to love somebody if you do not love the ones that He loves. And for Imam Hussein al-Islam, Rasulullah Sussum says what? For Hassan and Hussein, he says, Ya oh Allah, I love them, so love those who love them. And hate those or have animosity against those who hate them. So this is a battle of Iman versus fake Iman. 
This is the battle between true Iman, which is represented by Imam Hussein al-Islam and those with him, against the lip service of Iman, which has no meaning. And we see the disproportionate number here too. 72 who are pure against 22,000. You know, it's like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created Adam alayhi salam and He said, take those out who are for Jannah. He took out those for Jannah separated those for Jannah from those for the fire. And what was the distribution? One out of the thousand for Jannah, the remaining 999 for the fire. So the numbers here shouldn't surprise us either. So simply because somebody says, Allahu Akbar, The words, unless they're coming from the heart, have no meaning. So after they martyred him, you know, there's this commotion. And the horse of Imam Hussein al-Islam comes back to the tent. And this is when Bibi Zainab, the sister of Imam Hussein al-Islam, the daughter of the, uh, of, uh, the leader of the women of Jannah, Bibi Fatima, salamu alayha, she comes out and she comes rushing forward, breaking through the crowd, seeing her brother laying there, or rather his body laying there on the sands of, of Karbala. They've already ripped his clothes off and another one of them is holding his head by, the, by, by his uh, locks. You know, the blessed head, head of Imam Hussein al-Islam, he's holding it by the locks. You know, and again, we can't imagine, you know, the condition that she's in. But when she sees this, she calls out. She says, Ya Muhammad. And we'll come back to this aspect in a minute. But she says, Ya Muhammad. This is the Hussein who used to slay and sleep on your chest, on your blessed chest. And now he is in, you know, laying here in, in, the, in the dust of Karbala. This is the one who used to ride on your shoulders. And again, laying in his blood. Ya Allah. And we spoke about this slogan, Ya Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know. Also when we spoke about Abu Bakr Siddiq. Because this is was this was the code word that he gave them when they went to fight Muselma in Yamama. That the code word will be Ya Muhammad. Now it's interesting here. You know, if you look at all of the companions of Rasulullah and you look at even the wives of Rasulullah. None of them were called Rasulullah Sussam by his name. They would always say, Ya Rasulullah. Even in the Quran, if you read the Quran, you know, there are various places in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to various prophets, calls them by their name. Wama tilke, wama tilke Musa. What is in your right hand, O oh, 
Musa a.s. Various other prophets, he calls them out by their name. Oh, so and so. There's no place in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Rasulullah by his name. Or even swears by his name. And this is interesting because this is one of the things that these, uh, you know, these Christians these days, that they try to use against us. It's, oh, see, in the Quran, you know, the name of Jesus, peace be upon him, is mentioned so many times, and yet the name of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is only mentioned three or four times. What? Four times. Four times. And even there, it's not calling the name. It is like Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Or in Surah Muhammad, you know, where the revelation comes upon Muhammad not calling him by the name whenever he is called him he said what? he said Ya ayyuhal muzzammil Ya ayyuhal muddathir whatever condition he's in Allah calls him by the condition or Ya ayyuhal nabi Now, this is an expression of love. You know, when you truly love somebody to an extent that you don't love anyone else, you know, you don't call them by their name. You call them by whatever, whatever uh, state they're in. You know, even like, you know, if, and to understand this, to try to you know, and, the, and the examples don't do justice to what you're trying, what we're trying to explain. But you know, to give, get a understand, a slight understanding of this, you know, you look like even between husband and wife, you know, there's a pet name. Again, these are expressions of love. So it is. Is it allowed to call Rasulullah to by his name? None of the companions ever did it. The one that did it, I'm going to talk about in a second, and he wasn't a companion. But you can't say that he's Sahabi. Jibreel al Islam does it, but he doesn't do it. See, there's a difference in calling someone by their name and calling them by their sifat, by their characteristic. Muhammad وسلم, is not only the name of Rasulullah, it is also his sifat, it's his characteristic. What does Muhammad mean? Highly mm -hmm. The one who is praised extensively, extreme, highly praised. It comes from Hamd. You know, like we say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All praises for Allah, Lord of the worlds. You know, you have Muhammad, Ahmad, Mahmud, and Hamid. All of these are derivatives of Hamd. All of them are characteristics of Rasulullah. They are among his various names. So also here when when Abu Bakr says to say Ya Muhammad, or when Bibi Zainab calls out Ya Muhammad, you know, she's not referring to him by the name but by his characteristic. That oh the one who is highly praised. Yeah. See, the one who called him by his name was Zul Khoisra. And you know, this is mentioned in, say, Muslim as well as Bukhari and various other narration, narrators of hadith. Basically, almost every book of hadith has this incident mentioned in there. And there's a difference as to exactly which battle, but most scholars say, yeah, it was Hunayn. You know, so after the Battle of Hunayn, you have so much spoils of war coming. More than any other battle to that point. You, know, you had 40,000 goats and sheep. 6,000 slaves or captures, captives of war, war prisoners. 4,000 ounces of gold. 24,000 camels. Gold, other things, armor, all this other spoils of war that's collected. Hmm? And when a Rasulullah system starts distributing it, he doesn't distribute it in the typical manner. You know, 
in Islam, you know, there are two types of spoils of war. You have anfal, which is the spoil of war that's accumulated after a battle in which there is fighting. And then you have fay, which is spoils of war that are accumulated where the enemy surrenders without fighting. Fay is 100% for Allah and His Messenger. Anfal, the concept is that 20% for Allah and His Messenger and 80% for the army, those who took part in the battle. And there's a difference in the distribution that the horsemen get tw twice the amount of the foot soldier and so forth. And there's a way of distributing it. But if you read Surah Anfal, which is Surah number 8, uh, which was revealed after the Battle of Badr, because that's when they initially had spoils of war, and now the question comes, well, how is it distributed? And so the beginning verse, right, af, right, right at the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yes, alunaka anil, anil, yes, alunaka anil anfal. Yes, alunaka anil anfal. You know, that they ask you about the spoils of war. And again, anfal is the spoils of war collected after a fighting battle. Qulil anfalu lillahi wa rasooli. Tell them that the spoils of war are for Allah and His Messenger. And whatever the messenger gives, you take it. And whatever he doesn't give, you don't take it. Stay away from it. That whatever this messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gives you, accept it. And whatever he tells you, stay away from, stay away from it. So the reality is even that 80% that is distributed in a different manner is truly for Allah and His Messenger. But this is the mercy of Allah and the Messenger that they give you this 80%. You know, if you read the, the rest of the verse, you know, in the end Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa Allah wa Rasulu. Wa Allah wa Rasulu. Obey Allah and His Messenger. In kuntum mu'mini, if you are truly believers. So in this battle, after Hunayn, Rasulullah Sussan is sitting in front of all the spoils. And Abu Sufyan, who had just accepted Islam, he comes. And he looks at Rasulullah Sussan and he smiles. And he says, Oh Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah, he doesn't say, Oh Muhammad, he says, Ya Rasulullah, you have become the richest man in Arabia. Rasulullah smiles back at him and he says, What do you want from this? He says, Whatever you give. So Rasulullah tells Bilal, you know, Bilal wasn't only the Mu'addin of Rasulullah, he was also his treasurer. Now many of us forget this. So he tells Bilal, he's give, give him a hundred camels and forty ounces of gold. And so Abu Sufyan, when he sees this generosity, he says, Ya Rasulullah, so what about my son Yazid? He's got a son whose name was Yazid. This is different than this Yazid. He said, what about my son Yazid? He said, he says to Bilal, he says, give him the same. He says, ah. He says, Ya Rasulullah, what about my son Mawiyah? He says, give him the same. Safwan bin Umayyah, who hasn't even become Muslim yet, he had loaned Rasulullah a 100 suits of armor for this battle. He's looking at the property that all of this wealth is sitting on. You can imagine all these animals and all this. It wasn't a small piece of property. It's just huge. And Rasulullah Sussam asked him, he says, do you like this property? He says, yes. He says, it's yours. And then he realizes that this isn't something of kingship. Kings don't give like this. This is something totally different. This is when he accepts Islam. But then when Rasulullah starts distributing among the soldiers, he distributes it. He doesn't give anyone like he gave all of these leaders of Quraysh. You know, they get a set amount. 
One amongst them was Zul Khwaisra, At Tamimi An Najdi. You know, like you read the name of uh, uh, Abdul Aziz bin Baz. If you read the whole name, it says At Tamimi An Najdi. Same blood. So Zul Khwaisra, he feels cheated. So he comes to Rasulullah so and he says, Oh Muhammad, Ya Muhammad. And he says, Do justice. And Rasulullah so and looks at him and he says that if I do not do justice, then who can do justice? And then he says, If I do not do justice, you will all be destroyed. And then he turns his back and he walks away. Omar, Radiyan, who's standing there, he pulls out his sword and he says, Ya Rasulullah, suppose so, give me permission. And another narration, Khalid bin Walid, Radiyan, is also there and he also pulls his sword out. Ali, Radiyan, is also there. Various other companions are there. These three are known by name. And then Rasulullah Sussam says to them, he says, no, let him go. Because from his progeny and those who associate with him will come a people who will recite the Qur'an in such a way that you will be ashamed of your recitation. But the Qur'an will not get below their collarbones, means it won't enter their heart. And they will think that on the day of judgment, it will... It will testify for them, but in reality, it will testify against them. You know, he's saying this to Al Khattab, Ibn Al Khattab. You know, Omar, Radio, these are people who are experts in the language. If you look at Tajweed, Hafs, Hafs was, uh, as far as the rules being documented, by a student of Sayyidina Ali. You know, the various forms of Tajweed. So he's saying this to them, that you will be ashamed of your recitation when you hear them. Yet they have nothing from this religion. And then he says that your salat will be seem insignificant to theirs, and your, your fasting will seem insignificant to theirs, but they will pass through Islam like an arrow through its prey, with nothing on the tip, nothing on the shaft, nothing on the end. You know, when the arrow goes, it doesn't come back, meaning there's no thoba for them. And why there is no thoba for them? Because they follow the one who was disrespectful to the Rasulullah. <laughs> and what does Allah SWT say in Surah Adab, Surah Ahza, uh, Surah Hujrat? When he talks about, do not raise your voice above the voice of the messenger. That your deeds will be wiped away and you won't even know it. One of the first criteria for Tawbah is that you acknowledge you've made a mistake. If you're unable to acknowledge you made a mistake, there is no Tawbah. And then in the end, in the, in the hadith in saying Muslim, the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi says that if the people knew what reward I would give them for fighting against such a people, they would think that that one action of theirs is enough to enter paradise. So this is the one who called Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi by his name. And this is the condition, not only of him, but those who associate with him. And that association didn't simply mean then because when Ali Radin was asked about the Khawarij after the battle of uh, Nahwan, he said, they, they, told, they say to him, Oh Ali, you have destroyed all of the Khawarij. He said, No. He said, They are in the wombs of women and in the loins of men, and they will be here until the day of Qiyamah. Wow. So they are here today. You know, so this concept of ours, of, Oh, we're all the same. We say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That is not what Allah and His Messenger have taught us. And everything that comes from the lips of Rasulullah is exactly how Allah SWT loves for him to say it. وَمَا يَنْتُعَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَىٰ 
that he does not say anything from his own self, but everything that he says is nothing except revelation. revelation. One form of that revelation is the Quran. But then the other form is the Hadith, where, whether it's Hadith uh, Faili or Qawli or uh, Taqriri or whatever, it's still Hadith and it is still part of Revelation. I'm going to stop here today. Uh, you know, there's a lot I haven't covered. It doesn't matter how long we talk about this, there will always be a lot that doesn't get covered. Um, I'll see what I talk about next week. Uh, this is, you know, Rajab has started, so we're going to shift a little bit. But we also need to remember that the atrocities against the household of Rasulullah SAW didn't end in the field of Karbala. They continue on. And we need to understand that and know that and acknowledge that in order to understand what is going on today within the Ummah. And how they dealt with those atrocities which is really the lesson that we need to take. So we'll talk about that at some point, inshallah. inshallah. Uh, and, uh, but like I said, you know, because of timing, uh, things will shift a little bit, inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our hearts with His true love, the true love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, His family, His companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah, go and make sunnah, inshallah.